My guest today, uh, Billy Carson, actually has completed a movie on the Black Knight Satellite. I had a chance to see it. We have Billy with us. If you don't know who Billy Carson is, he is an entrepreneur. When he uh, wrote the Emerald Tablet book, which was a pretty well uh, received publication, and he's been doing a lot of stuff. He's in this alternative field, just like me, but he's out there. Uh, very, very active, and uh, we have him today to talk a little bit about this new movie. So, hey, Billy, welcome to Earth Ancients. Great to see you. Thank you. I'm <laughs> glad to be back. It's been a while. Yeah, it's been great. Hey, tell us what your interest was in the Black Knight. Uh, it's been around, you know, it was discovered in 1960, but mm -hmm. personally, what on a personal scale, what was your interest well, you know, after looking into aerospace is where I, where I really got into this entire field. I started off in aerospace first, yeah. researching aerospace, researching uh, our own technology, you know, delta wing, swept wing, ballistic intercontinental and all this kind of stuff as a kid and becoming completely obsessed with, uh, with aerospace and aerospace technology. And I just progressed over the years, continue, continuing to research and investigate, kind of became a quasi aerospace historian. And then... One day, uh, just in my research about maybe 12 years ago now, as we say, I came across uh, the Black Knight Satellite, some writings about the Black Knight Satellite on a web forum. And I was like, what is this? And so I kind of just read through it a little bit briefly and I kind of just, okay, you know, whatever. And then it came up again about maybe a month later. Then again, on a third time it came up, I said, you know what? Let me look into this thing. <laughs> Someone's <laughs> because, telling you to check it out. <laughs> right. Somebody's <laughs> like, hey, man, you need to look at this. <laughs> so I said, let me, so I started digging into this and looking into the Black Knight. And the more I started digging, then I said, I, I came up with, you know, the people wanting to debunk it. And so I analyzed the debunking information and I would put that against my own knowledge, my own understanding of basic science. And then, of course, researching some of the technology that was used on those missions to see if it, if the debunking even worked. And I found some holes here and there in the debunking. So I said, this needs further research. So I started actually writing a little forum about it, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago now, yeah. uh, which was which is still online somewhere, just kind of putting together all the little tiny pieces of the puzzle and letting everybody just take a look at it. And it got so much popularity. I said, you know, one day I'm going to do a whole documentary on this thing. And then that one day finally came about three years ago when I actually, you know, said, this is it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to go ahead and put the energy, the effort, the money into creating this documentary because the whole world needs to know not only about the Black Knight, but about the potential implications for mankind into the future. Yeah. You know, it's funny because you're, you're, uh, I, it's a documentary, right? We yeah. can just call it that. It's not a movie, it's right. a documentary. Documentary, yeah. When we look at it, you bring to bear the whole uh, US Space Command, NASA, JPL, whatever, and their adherence to a cover up of anything. Out of the ordinary. Now, the U.S. Space Command rebranded the term UFO to unidentified aerial phenomenon. Why would they do that, Billy? Why do you think <laughs> they would do something like that? Because that's yeah. a big thing to do. That's a huge thing to do. And so what they've done is I don't, uh, they did that. Plus, they also now are allowing active military duty to make their own, uh, you know, claims on what they've seen and what they've experienced which has never happened before. So those two things together for me are like red flags saying they are ready to control the narrative on this extraterrestrial UFO, whatever it is, situation. Uh, and so what they've done is, okay, we need to repackage this thing because UFO has all these bad connotations because we actually programmed the people to think UFOs were bad and scary and that they don't exist and they're nothing but swamp gas. And between Hollywood and the military and the industrial complex, they've yeah. got everybody you know, panicking. So what they said, you know what, we're going to repackage this UAP. Now, if it's a completely repackaged, means the same exact thing. This is all neuroscience. You know, I went to MIT for neuroscience. This is exactly what they teach you there. They repackage this whole thing, rephrase it, uh, give it the official stamp of approval. And now we can openly talk about this because we restamped it and packaged it with our own little labeling, our own little branding on it. And now we're open to talk about this. Plus, we now have the ability to control the narrative. The second thing is also Space Force. Now, they've got this Space Command that's been around for so long, people didn't even know it existed. Now they've relabeled that Space Force, where yeah. now they can redirect money because we have to know about these UAPs. We got to redirect trillions of dollars 
into the Space Force. So it gives them away when there's not a lot of wars on Earth. How do we make money? Well, you make money by creating the potential idea or concept that there could be a potential war. And there's nobody left on Earth to beat up. So now we got to make it come from space. So I think that, you know, by controlling that narrative, they also now have the capability of directing trillions of dollars into their own private space programs. What's your feeling uh, about the stories of uh, Dwight Eisenhower uh, meeting with uh, ETs uh, just before the 60s in, in the California desert? That's a big rumor. And you have a couple of people on your documentary who are actually ufologists, fairly well known. Uh, do you ever hear about that story? Because I, I mean, from, from for years, I heard that there was an agreement with an alien group, you yeah. know, and who in the hell knows what's going on there? I know it's pretty bizarre. It's supposed to be an agreement with the group. There was supposed to be two groups. One group only wanted to offer health and vitality and ex life extension and cleaning up, uh, you know, the atmosphere and not using uh, fossil fuels. And the other group, um, we're talking about providing some weapons in exchange for supposedly some a small number of abductions of human beings for just testing and <laughs> research purposes. Yeah. yeah. But the whole thing is I did talk to Laura Eisenhower and I've been in conferences with her and so forth. She claims that she believes it's accurate. Now that's the great granddaughter of Dwight D. Eisenhower. She even claims that a certain contingent of them and that bloodline and some other people were handpicked to go to Mars. Uh, in, in a 2006 or 2008, somewhere back in the early 2000s, and she chose not to go. The, whether it's true or not, I don't know, but she's made that open. That's her quote, her open statement. She was on uh, George Norrie's show. I think it was Coast to Coast AM talking about that years ago. Yeah. Uh, and she's made it, that statement many times since then as well. Hmm. Let's talk about the Black Knight satellite. Um, it was, uh, we, uh, the Americans had developed long-range radar right after the Second World War. And uh, we also began using ballistic missiles to launch uh, early test pilots as well as uh, mm -hmm. multiple, multiple stage rockets. And the early indications were that this was uh, the Black Knight, before it was called the Black Knight, was a, uh, a, a different stage of a, a test rocket. Mm -hmm. Now, my understanding, and I'd like to hear from you on this, is that because it was able to correct its orbit, mm -hmm. that was one of the early indications that it was not uh, simply a, the body of a rocket. Talk a little bit about the early detection of what eventually became known as the Black Knight satellite. Yeah, there's actually a couple of occurrences where this object changed its own, it made its own course correction. Yeah. So that takes away ice crystals, you know, the ice particle theory. <laughs> That's yeah. gone bye bye. The, 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 you know, the spent booster rocket stage, uh, you know, uh, you know, explanation, blow that away because they can't change course correction. There's a couple of times that this thing's actually changed course, according to witnesses. One, believe it or not, uh, when Sputnik was launched, supposedly, according to the Russians and everyone who was watching the sky, this thing made a course correction and followed Sputnik for a period of time. It also left a equatorial orbit and went into a polar orbit uh, at one point and uh, uh, sustained a polar orbit. And that's very difficult to do because right. that's, no one had done it up to that point. So, yeah. I mean, that's incredible. And if yeah. you look at, you know, you study ancient civilizations, you just look at, for example, the Giza Plateau and the Great Pyramid, you understand that in order to encode that much knowledge and wisdom and understanding into that plateau, and how it's a mirror of the interplanetary solar system and everything else dealing celestially, you'd have to have a polar orbiting satellite, number one, to be able to gather enough data on Earth to even create the, uh, build the uh, Great Pyramid. Because it's, you know, it's in the center of the land mass of the Earth. Right. At the center of the Earth, but the center of land mass. You need a polar, polar orbiting satellite for that. It also uh, can calculate the distance from the Earth to the moon and the Earth to the sun. It has all this encoded into the structure itself, uh, you know, and it's built at the average height of the, the peaks on Earth. Well, you need a polar orbiting satellite to scan all the peaks and then divide them by the average height to get the number to say, OK, now let's build this pyramid at this height. That all requires a polar orbiting satellite. And so this thing is intelligently designed, intelligently made as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's been up there and it's, you know, it's made a couple of course corrections that are that we that we know of, according to witnesses and accounts. 
uh, which I was like I said, it, it blows a lot of the debunking information away. Yeah. Now, it's interesting because you spent a, a lot of time on this documentary talking about the Epsom Bullis uh, constellations, yeah. B- Buddhists, excuse me. Mm-hmm. And um, how did you track the two? Uh, I mean, I know that there is was some signals that various, I don't know if it was Tesla or somebody, talk a little bit about the connection yeah. where this uh, uh, unmanned mm-hmm. satellite may have come from. Yeah. Well, in 1953, some radio ham radio operators detected the signal from the Black Knight mm-hmm. and started playing around with decoding this signal and were successfully able to decode it. Uh, and I say successfully because somebody else did it later on and it came back with the same information that it uh, was giving off a signal of a constellation named Epsilon Bootis, Bootis, uh, the Bootis constellation. And what's interesting about that is it was giving off the location of that constellation where it was in the sky, according to procession of the equinoxes, about yeah. 13,000 years ago. 11, 11 to 13, depending on the, the, uh, the, the, uh, you know, the way you translate it. Right. Now, Duncan Lunan, who wrote an article in Time magazine, was a journalist, wrote an actual article in Time magazine in 1960. We caught up with him, and he's actually in the documentary. I found him in the UK. Yeah. And so I was excited to be able to get, get to him, you know, and have him give his own, you know, take. Yeah. But he actually decoded the signal as well. Now, what's interesting about his decoding is he spelt Votus wrong. Now, if you're going to fake this thing, why not just spell the word right? He decoded it and wrote it as the decoding came back. And according to him, it's 11,000 years from where this thing was in the sky. Uh, but still 11 to 13,000 years, give or take a thousand years or so, still comes back to Epsilon. So I said, man, this Epsilon thing is so powerful. How can independent people come up with this same location of this constellation? So I said, you know, I because I believe that this was an all-seeing eye of Enlil in ancient Sumeria. But I said, before I say that, let me research it. You know how it is. Yeah. So again, and the first thing I found was that the Epsilon Bootis constellation, in according to the Sumerian tablets, has been attributed to ownership of Enlil from the Babylonian text, from the ancient Babylonian uh, era. And I'm like, this is crazy. He talked about having an all-seeing eye in his tablets. He can see what's going on on Earth anywhere on the planet. He was able to see different population densities, who was growing crops, who weren't. He can say, kill these people's crops over here because I want they're making too much noise or they're causing calamity. I want to wipe them out. He would do all these crazy things. But he used this all-seeing eye to do this. To me, that's a polar orbiting satellite. What else can give you the ability to see what's going on on the planet in a day? Good it's got to be something like that. So yeah. it's interesting that he is somehow linked to Epsilon and he's got this object that's an all-seeing eye. And then this object is giving off a signal saying it's linked to Epsilon in some weird kind of way. So could some of these Anunnaki beings be from Epsilon? It's possible. That's, that's a great uh, uh, possibility. Yeah. Do you think uh, Epsilon is the uh, home of the Black Knight satellite or of the beings who created the satellite? And the satellite's basically an Earth creation m- made by uh, the Anunnaki. Yeah, I believe it's Anunnaki created it here, or, or maybe they brought it here with them, but it seems like their own creation and that they may themselves hail from Epsilon. And this thing could be transmitting, you know, uh, according to like some of the later tablets, there was this last pyramid war, uh, which is where you see the, the Mohenjandara in the Indus Valley and you see the, you know, the buildings turning to glass and the dead bodies still laying in the streets to this very day. And the sands of Egypt where the Nile is completely gone away from the pyramid area. <clears throat> That's a little result of war. And so it seems to me like after this great last war, which used some type of a nuclear weapon, 3,000 plus degree temperature and radiation, they fled. But I think they left that satellite. They stripped all the technology off of Earth, but they left this satellite. And it could be transmitting to them still at this very minute everything that's going on on Earth. Kind of like I'm watching over what we worked on, what we helped this breakaway civilization that we created or started or kickstarted or this seed, this seed planet that we, you know, uh, worked on. Uh, and it could be transmitting through a quantum entanglement type of a frequency where it can instantaneously transcend space and time and hit their receivers wherever they are in Epsilon. And what's interesting is Michio Kaku on a video that I was watching, he said that there's a void in Epsilon, which I discovered that's an actual scientific fact in aerospace. There's a void there. 
And that void looks like lights being bent around it. There's nothing there, not even dust. And Michio Kaku said he thinks it's a cloaked advanced civilization. All this is coming together. Can we see uh, Epsilon with our telescopes now? I mean, yeah. what do we get? We, I mean, how far away is it from Earth? Is it like must be a thousand light years or something ridiculous? Epsilon is, I get, give you the exact number. It's, uh, it's quite a bit of ways, actually. It's, it's a little bit of a distance. Uh, I mean, it, uh, I'm trying to think. One light year is uh, some like a some insane amount of uh, yeah. distance distance from Earth. So, it's, uh, uh, so epsilon is ten point four seven light years. Okay, that's pretty far, but not. Yeah. I mean, it's not like impossible. But with our current yeah, technology, it's not, probably yeah, take twenty million light years. You know, some places are twenty million light. Yeah, years, you know, it, <laughs> you but know? it would still take us a few hundred years with our current technology to get any place yeah. close to it. So, right. Talk but about if you, have, if you have quantum entanglement, though, for communications purposes, it's instantaneous. Yeah. Um, before we get into the 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 construction as it is understood of this uh, uh, sentient satellite, talk a little bit about the American military's response when they first detected it. They you you talk about Clyde Tombaugh, yeah. who was an astronomer. He actually discovered Pluto. In 1930, but uh, talk a little bit about the the Americans' response. I mean, I think in the beginning they may have thought it was something the Russians had put up. Yeah. And oh, the they were kind of shocked. It. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, imagine there's supposed to be nothing up there, number one, and then all of a sudden you detect something and it's giving off of a, giving off a signal. Yeah. Uh, the first reaction, of course, is it's Russia. <laughs> exactly. And Russia. You know, and then Russia's first response was a reaction was it's America. <laughs> so we had this, <laughs> you know, we almost went to war over something that we both didn't even own. I mean, that's how crazy we are as people on this planet. You know, the paranoia uh, and, and also the ego that would say that nothing should be there when, you know, we're kind of the new kids on the block. According to our paradigm, our understanding, we think that nothing should be up, right, up there until we put it there. But the reality was this thing was there. And so they gave it an estimate weight, about 15 tons. And when they realized, this is what stopped the war from happening. When they both realized that neither one of us can put up 15 tons in space at that time, <laughs> that was it. We realized we had an anomaly. How, how much detail did uh, Tombaugh contribute to, I mean, the thing was, I mean, the thing is uh, uh, flying at some huge rate of speed is what yeah. I understand. And when Tombaugh was on the scene, I mean, obviously he was an astronomer. They didn't have telescopes that could really track it that well, did they? Um, I mean, just not, basically I mean, not compared to what we have now. Yeah. But, you know, we had the mathematics, you know. So mm -hmm. because we had the mathematics that gave us the ability to create, um, uh, create a trajectory. And so he was able to come up with the trajectory of this object, which way it was orbiting, how it was orbiting. Uh, you know, the speed that it was orbiting based off the mathematics. Yeah. And uh, and that literally uh, was the main reason why it became, you know, it really got on the radar. It was because of Clyde Tom Tombaugh. You know, I, I have to laugh a little bit because all of this happened before the uh, intelligence uh, agencies really came into to be. CIA hadn't really been formed yet. And we yeah. had rudimentary intelligence with the, with this uh, armed services so when I think it was the Look magazine named this the Black Knight satellite, the articles were coming out. Yeah. <laughs> Talk a little bit about the articles that they're going, hey, this is this object they, they've been tracking. Yeah. Uh, and it is uh, not known what it is. It's not, the Russians say it's not ours. Yeah. I mean, that must have been kind of a, a like a soap, uh, soap opera. <laughs> oh, man. I imagine. I mean, you know, at that time, just the, even the concept of space was, uh, 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 you know, alluring to everyone. The concept that there could be something that, that people were seeing how we were ourselves were advancing technologically, like in leaps and bounds. And so the probability of leading out, you know, reaching out into space was like a reality all of a sudden. I mean, by now they thought we would be in flying cars and all this. Right. Yeah. Um, right. And so did I. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, but these articles were coming out and they were like sizzling titles and topics talking about the Black Knight and coming out in mainstream papers. Yeah. talking about the fact at one point that there were two objects that they were detecting up there as well when there should have been nothing up there 
And Eric von Daniken hypothesized, according to his research and studies, that the universe and even our solar system is full of these probes. He calls them probes. Yeah, amazing. Talk a little bit, and I want to get into the details of the, the body and structure of the Black Knight Center. Talk a little bit about, and this is very strange, the mm -hmm. Brookings Institute uh, document that was uh, uh, ordered by uh, the early, I guess it was the government, uh, U.S. government, and if this and, and that document basically says that if we have first contact, religions will go crazy, people will jump out of buildings. Yeah. This is in 1960. Yeah. So isn't this interesting that this document would be created right around the same time the Black Knight satellite is found? Right, exactly. That's when the Brookings Institute actually came out with this document that the government reviewed and agreed upon. It was 1960, right when this thing hit Time Magazine, <laughs> right in the height of its explosion into the world and understanding this thing is probably a real object, not from Earth. Here they come because they want to, again, reel in the system yeah. <clears throat> because they realized, man, let's do some projections here. If we cancel out religion, that's trillions of dollars, even in that time frame. If we cancel out, uh, you know, uh, you know, people understanding that there's technology out there better than using fossil fuels they're going to want to know how can we get to this stuff yeah. and the more we give more the more technological information we find out about the thing we if we give it to them they're going to expect us to give it to them as well and uh and then it, re it removes a whole lot of uh, uh, reliance on governments and government agencies and also it could set in some type of a fear like hey what can we how can, can we even defend ourselves against these things if they if they did show up obviously we po possibly can't because They've achieved this, and we haven't even gotten to put one in orbit yet. So all this, all these questions come up. So they figure, you know, if we want to keep status quo, keep people calm, keep people, uh, you know, wanting to uh, continue to contribute to us the way that we want them to contribute to us, we're going to have to, uh, you know, make sure that we put together some type of a, a system that will completely, uh, you know, keep people away from the truth and keep all the information suppressed and give them this side story, give them the propaganda. And that's what they've done. Very, they've done a very good job of it too for a very, very long time. Since 1960, I mean, here yeah. is a United States think tank. And basically what it says is, is, is the most negative reactions. They, and this is what drives me nuts is <laughs> that uh, the military is so antiquated and not really forward thinking. Why don't they look at today's social media and ask people, what they think on TikTok, yeah. on Facebook, on Twitter, Instagram, whatever. Mm -hmm. It's just amazing. And so we have this rebranding of UFOs to UAPs, and it hasn't changed since yeah. 1960, has it? It really no. has not changed. We're, yeah. we're uh, uh, being uh, lied to. It's it's uh, uh, hidden hidden information. And mm -hmm. literally, our, our skies are filled with <laughs> UFOs. No, it's crazy. <laughs> But you know, the biggest problem we have is capitalism. I hate to say it. Capitalism is great, but it can't be involved in everything. Once you involve capitalism into military and governments and prisons and healthcare, they all go down to tubes. And that's what we've seen. They've got so much capitalism in the government and in, in the military that man, if they can monopolize the story and control the narrative, they tend to make tons and tons of money. And that's, that's, that's exactly what they've done. Talk a little bit about uh, your belief that Tesla, in his early uh, work, may have had some form of either contact or uh, other signaling with either mm -hmm. the Black Knight satellite or other sophisticated cultures. Yeah, what's interesting with Tesla is he actually detected these signals coming from space. You know, this is in the late 1800s. I mean, this should be nothing. And he, you know, according to him as well, nothing should be coming from out there down here. And, and he's picking up all these radio signals. He's working on radio waves and experimenting with radio waves. And he's picking up these signals. He actually hypothesized maybe it's people on Mars. We're getting radio signals from Mars. You know, one of his, his, his exact quotes, I believe that he was getting signals right here from our own orbit from the Black Knight satellite, just didn't know that it was that close at hand because it, in his mind, he couldn't even conceive that there'd be a satellite up there yet. But um, but he thought it may have been coming from Mars. I think he may have been getting the signal from the Black Knight. 
Hmm, interesting. All right, let's talk about the Black Knight. You do a great job of uh, uh, of enhancing some photographs, and in one of the photographs, it looks like it has various body parts and aspects that could be who knows uh, uh, antennae. Uh, we don't know, but um, mm -hmm. what do we know about the configuration of the Black Knight? What's interesting is the actual. There's several images. Okay, it's really like about four or five. The fourth one is kind of the fifth one is kind of questionable, but the, 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 there's four different images on NASA's server. The one that I really believe is the black one is that one main image that you've seen. That's the main one that, right. that we show. Now we did a slight enhancement of it to bring out the contrast, and you can so you can see the different uh, the, the, the cornering and the 90 yeah. angles and everything else. Looks like wings and, and, and things like that. Yeah, exactly. But it hasn't been altered. Like it hasn't been photoshopped. It's just a different contrasting put on it to bring out and enhance what's already there. And what's interesting is this object kind of almost the way that the front bends and kind of look bends forward and kind of comes to almost like a point. It's to me, it's kind of like a hawk or some type of a bird. We know that these Sumerian people were huge on animals. Uh, you know, obviously they had the animal heads, which were really like helmets. Because in the text, they would talk about putting on the eagle's masks in certain situations when there was problems in the atmosphere. So mm -hmm. the, when you see an Anunnaki being with the eagle's head, it's actually the depiction of them wearing a helmet that had eagles on it. And this object looks like it could be potentially some type of an eagle's head to me or, or a bird's head. That's what it looks mm -hmm. like to me. They were huge on it. They passed that same tradition down to the ancient Egyptians who also utilized the heads of animals on things. Uh, so it kind of has that kind of a, a look to it, a technological, technologically created head of a bird in a way, in a weird kind of way. But also you can clearly see that it has mass and it has different sections. You can also see what looks like could be, from my perspective, my understanding of technology, a communications array on top, right. which could be what's sending information back and forth if they are transmitting information as to what's going on. You know, maybe we start a if we're popping off nukes on this planet, maybe it sends a signal, say, hey guys, they're destroying our heaven over here. You know, <laughs> you got to come over here and stop this. Who knows yeah. what it what it could be? Uh, but it really looks technological, it looks like it has a communications array. The body looks like it has significant mass. Uh, and it looks like, man, something out of us like we would see in a Hollywood movie. It doesn't look like anything we ourselves, the human beings, would create based yeah. on what satellites we keep putting up. I think it's funny that you guys estimated it's 15 tons because that's not something small. That's no. about the same. Well, it's, that's even bigger than some of the drones that we fly now. Uh, pilotless drones. They're huge. Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, uh, I'm curious. There's stories that it was shadowing the uh, different shuttle missions uh, mm -hmm. a few years ago. What do we know about that? And also talk a little bit about what some believe is nanotechnology for this, the body of this uh, craft to be uh, able to move as it speeds up or reduces speed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there have been accounts, even if you look at, let's go to the older account first with Buzz. There's an interview with Buzz Aldrin from the Apollo missions talking about the fact that they saw an object following them on the way to the moon. This is a publicly available video of him on a, on a mainstream interview talking about, and he said that we had to contact Houston and tell Houston, we, we didn't want to blow our mission and have to get it called off. So we told him, you know, we asked him, where was the, uh, you know, the, uh, the rocket booster, you know? <laughs> and they were like, that's gone a long time ago, man. What are you talking about? Right. <laughs> they already fell back to earth and burned up. Yeah. And he was like, well, okay. Cause they didn't want to say that there's, you know, an object following them. They were just trying to make sure it wasn't that booster, maybe tumbling through space along on the same trajectory. But it was, in my opinion, I think it was the Black Knight following them to the moon. Uh, pretty interesting stuff. And then uh, there was an issue where it did, you know, according to uh, Sputnik uh, documents, it, it seemed to have changed course and was following Sputnik. The Mercury missions, where they were looking up into space during the Mercury missions when Sputnik beat us. And they were observing space and they saw this thing change course. And then up in the later SCS missions, the shuttle missions, this thing had changed course a couple of times and followed a couple of missions. The STS-88 had a really good chance to fly by it and take some really HD, really good HD images of this thing. This thing is real. It's a real object. It's really up there. 
Uh, and as far as the nanotechnology, some of the things that I've heard about it, uh, it's kind of a little uh, still ambiguous, but that it has the ability even sometimes to change form and shape, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is pretty interesting because there's two objects out of the five that look like they have significant mass, definitely not a blanket, a space blanket, <laughs> okay? Yeah. Uh, but And both of them look like they are able to communicate technologically, like they look like a communications array is on top of both of them. And it's like, man, is this the same thing? Did it shape shift into this other form for whatever reason? And uh, so there's a hypothesis. It could be nanotechnology. Also, the fact that it has the capability of using that same technology to create its own different orbits is connected to some potential AI. And then it can, it can make course corrections and kind of think for itself, depending on what's going on on the planet. There's a lot to it, man. It's just it's so much to unpack. It is. You have a lot of great uh, interviews that you are doing with different experts. And I can't remember who it is, but the idea of a sentient being or a craft or a, a, an AI that is self-aware seems yeah. to come into the forefront. Why would we, why, why would a, a civilization create a sentient craft like that? Because that mm -hmm. we're, we're talking about, you know, hundreds if not a thousand years in the future well maybe not a thousand because a few hundred let's say that yeah, a few the hundred. technology is way beyond beyond our concept yeah but what do you think about a sentient craft it's possible it could be a quantum computer in there which for first of all and with the right ai programming it could be a learning program that's learning by watching us over time so over time, this craft starts off as a with a child's mind, so to speak, right? Technologically advanced, of course, still and has its own mission of observance, but also it has the capability, possibly, potentially, of being uh, sentient and conscious. And so over thousands of years, over eons, watching us grow and develop and to, to where we are now, especially in the last hundred years, going from a horse buggy and carriage to putting remote control cars on another planet. Uh, it could be collecting that information and watching us and learning and growing consciously by watching us. And mm -hmm. this could be um, a, an experiment. It could be a observatory, some type of a high-tech conscious observatory where all the data that it's collecting by, by observing and watching and becoming conscious and then actually making its own decisions, that information could then be downloaded somewhere else to create a better civilization on another, another planet see yeah. the planet and know how to, you know, how, know how to develop it the right way or terraform it the right way for people to come. Who knows? The, the possibilities are endless because we're dealing with beings that are so far ahead of us. And if you create a, 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 a unit that's AI and sentient and it can make its own decisions, uh, then you don't have to babysit it. You don't have to transmit a lot of information back and forth, course corrections, and everything. It can make its own decisions based on what it thinks it needs to do. Which is my what might be what some of these UFOs are uh, completely mm -hmm. pilotless, but they're sentient yeah. and uh, they have a, a role or a program to collect data mm -hmm. and then either leave planet uh, Earth or distribute the the information through some kind of signal technology. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Hey, talk about um, what's his name? Richard Dolan speaks on the astronauts. You hinted on it a little bit. Uh, these astronauts have to sign non-disclosure agreements, but, you mm -hmm. know, a lot of these guys on their deathbed are, are like saying, no, I saw this. Mm -hmm. This is what <laughs> happened. Yeah. And uh, NASA said, if you speak, we're going to ruin your life. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's a tough one, man. That is yeah. a tough one because we get hints about these uh, mm -hmm. uh, space missions uh, in, you know, uh, in the moon uh, yep. orbiting Earth. And they're actually seeing stuff, aren't they? Oh, they're seeing a lot of stuff. And what's interesting is, so we have the NASA black box audio from Apollo 11. It's from the Freedom of Information Act, which is one of the main reasons why they stopped using uh, themselves and went private so that we couldn't get this information anymore. But the Apollo 11 is accessible. All the data is accessible by the general public. Let me stop you real quick, Billy. What year was the 11? Uh, was that like 1965 or something? No, Apollo 11, I believe that was 68 or 69. 68. And so so yeah. Apollo 11 was a test run, though, wasn't it? it Apollo wasn't 11, a... Apollo 10 was a test run. Apollo 11 actually landed on the moon. Okay, good. Okay, so I'm sorry. I just want to get clear on, because there's yeah. so many of the emissions, and I, I wanted to get the, 
the clear. So go ahead and talk a little bit about what you discovered in this feed. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, so Apollo 11 was 69, by the way. Okay. Uh, and so as they were orbiting uh, the moon to look for their landing spot, uh, one of the astronauts in the, in the capsule, he says that, look at those, uh, those convex uh, craters down there, which means he's, saying, he's trying to say there's a dome. It's code for a dome. It's, it's not a crater, it's a convex. And he's saying, and then Neil says, I bet the people down there never get out. And that's on the audio. Yeah. <laughs> this, is public, this is from nasa.gov. What is that? De this. What's the deco when you hear that? Oh, are man. They, are they seeing somebody? They're seeing, I think that they realize that there's people down there. They probably already had a foreknowledge of people living on the moon. Some of those craters don't look like real craters. I've been analyzing the craters for years. And yeah. what's interesting is there's no ejecta around the edge of a lot of these craters. Oh, the, like, in, the impact ejecta. The impact. Yeah. So an yeah. impact ejecta, there's gravity on the moon, even though it's light gravity. The ejecta should fall around the rim of the right. edge. Right. There's hardly any ejecta. And then a lot of these craters all have the same estimated depth. Now, that seems pretty fishy to me. Like, what's stopping these impacts from going any deeper than what they are? And none of them come in angles. They're all straight down, straight head on. There's no angles. Nothing hits and slides into a spot where you can see in a, that a is slide, you know? And so I'm hypothesizing that some of these, if, they, if you have the technology, some of these craters could be artificially uh, you know, craters. In other, in other words, they could be projecting a crater from some type of a digital medium but underneath, it's not really a crater. It's just people down there. And what's interesting about this in the ancient Sumerian tablets, I always go back to these tablets. These tablets are incredible. They talk about there was a war between two relatives that were gods. And uh, one, one of these uh, relatives, he had basically did something legal and stole these records and these tablets of destiny. He got caught. He, they got him back, but they banished him and his entire offspring to the moon for all eternity. Wow. Could this be the race that was banished from the Sumerian tablets that's living on the moon? I mean, it's, I mean, it's just stuff sounds outlandish, but to me, I mean, I, I think it's pretty, I think it's pretty, um, I think it's pretty real. I, I just believe yeah. that what these people wrote, they didn't have time to write sci-fi movies back then. <laughs> I think they wrote down what they, what they were told. Or, or what it's what we, we, we consider it mythology, which is yeah. actually probably uh, the truth. Right. But, but, but because we, we don't have anything to validate it. Right. Uh, and our scientific method is so antiquated. We, oh, you know, we consider it a story. Talk, yeah. uh, you spend some time in this movie. And for those of you listening, this is a very well put together documentary. And uh, Billy has done a good job in actually showing the uh, typed pages of the dialogue between these astronauts and houston so talk a little bit more about some of the other anomalous features of the moon that they they actually encountered yeah it's incredible stuff i mean they they actually had a alien uh or extraterrestrial uh object under observance and that's the exact words that they use it's still under observance and houston is communicating back with them to say do you still see the craft the alien craft and they're like yeah we still have it we have it under observance right now <laughs> i mean as it's they're official. orbiting, or was this next to the orbiter itself, or was it was it the guys on the ground? No, the this guy? was in the, or next to the orbiter itself in space. Oh, oh really? Yeah. <laughs> God, that would freak me out. Oh man, tell me about it. You know, and so they've got that, and then you know the NSA has a document talking about how to communicate with ET, how to communicate back and forth with them, <gasps> and how to understand to break down and decode these signals. This is what Jimmy Church is talking about in the documentary that I wrote that we filmed, and so. What's interesting, again, is not only that they're, they're using experiences from these astronauts and some signals that they've been getting from space, according to this NSA document, but they've decoded this information. And what's in this decoding? Epsilon Bootis. Why are they talking about Epsilon Bootis and communicating with Epsilon Bootis? What is the link here? Again, an NSA document, an official document. Again, talking about this same location that we think the black man is linked to, that the ancient Sumerians are linked to, and now the NSA is also linked to. There's something there. This, this is circumstantial evidence. So, you know, in America, if you have enough circumstantial evidence, you can put somebody in prison. <laughs> oh, boy. I think you can make a case. You can make a strong case for circumstantial evidence. I think we have a strong case here. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that uh, uh, translation uh, of that, communication is fascinating to read yeah. and that you are able to get a hold of it is also amazing simply because 
that's so rare yeah it's yeah. so rare they're covering it with the biggest pile of whatever yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't let you get in there um yeah. so as we come to to the conclusion of our time together uh, mm. what is the what is your feeling about it it currently this i mean it's mm -hmm. been there for thousands of years the, uh, the black knight yeah. satellite but have we i mean there's rumors that they tried to grab it with one of the shuttle missions you mm -hmm. know with the big arm grabbing it yeah. uh and it's very elusive obviously if it's a sentient craft it can't yeah. be grabbed or it moves out of the way but what's your feeling on what they're trying to do with it right now yeah i think that <clears throat> i think hold on <clears throat> i think that they're really trying to communicate with this thing and, and understand how to how to un understand how, what it can do what it can't do is it a threat what types of uh self-defense functionality is built into it uh, because you got to remember, we're dealing with something that's uh, millions of millions of years potentially ahead of us technologically, especially Could if it can be. last that many years in space and be operate operative. If, if if that date is true, uh, and so if you want to go at something like this, you have to really ask yourself a couple of questions. If we come at this thing, is it going to number one use some type of self def defense feature on us that we can't stop? Is it going to send a signal to someone? to say, hey, I need help, and then they come, and then we can't <laughs> stop them. Uh -huh. It's almost best to just you know, listen to it and try to decipher it and try to understand it and see if it's a threat. <clears throat> yeah, I was waiting for you. To, you're, you're getting close to the Independence yeah. Day scenario, the movie, <laughs> Billy. I was going, <laughs> dude, what do you what's going on here, man? This is sounding yeah. scary. <laughs> hey, Billy, I really appreciate the time. I know you're